people and little people alike. Two words. Welcome back. Woo! <laughs> Welcome home. Dot for you. Okay. All right. Green one, Noah? Okay. Johnny Ray, what color would you like? Johnny Ray wants pink. We have an honorary child up here. Johnny Ray's 18, but you're never too old for the children's moment, right? Okay. <laughs> and there we go. All right. I may never get up again, but okay. Not yet, but here. Why don't you use this? There you go. Scooch a little closer. All right. All right, boys. Have y'all ever played dress up? Yes. Dress up. You play dress up. You gotten all nice and handsome. <laughs> Maybe a suit. Maybe walk downstairs, and mom and dad cheered you on, right? Walk down the steps, and they're like, "Woo!" Have you ever done that, Jay? You've done that? What did mom and dad do? What did they say? They say you look handsome? You look so handsome. Right? They were so happy to see you, right? So a long time ago in Jerusalem, have you ever heard of like the procession? Like a red carpet, baby? Have you heard of a red carpet? Like this? Have you, Noah? Yep. Yeah, what happens on the red carpet? Johnny Ray, what happens on that red carpet? Famous people. Famous people, yeah. celebrities, right? And everybody's cheering for them, and they look so handsome and beautiful. Have you heard of a time where something like that happened to Jesus? Where people were so excited to see him? How about just now, huh? Have you seen that? Yeah, they were waving palms to welcome him. And they put him on the ground? Instead of a red carpet, he had a green carpet, right? full of palms. So that's what uh, Reverend Susie is going to be teaching us today about the Palm Sunday, all right, in Jerusalem. So why do you think that was important? Why do you think they did that, Noah, for Jesus? He was famous. He was important, right? He's the most important person there is, isn't there? So I got a question. Jesus is always with us, right? So can we honor him and make him feel important every day of our life? Yes. How do you think we could do that? Um, reading the Bible. Reading the Bible, praying. Praying. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Doing any nice things for other people, right, Jay? Mm -hmm. Using nice words, oh, kind words. Ten you and those oh, Ten Commandments. Ten commandments. <laughs> You're right. Very good. Yeah. All right, so I have a little thing for you this week, all of you, even you back there. I want you to go home this week sometime and turn off the TV, turn off, take a minute, 10 minutes, and read the Bible. Do something to honor Jesus and make him feel important in your life. Okay? So Reverend Susie is going to pray for us today. Okay. Let's stand up, everybody. And big people, you are, oh, wonderful. All right. <laughs> let's stand up together and let's pray together. I'll lead and you follow. All right? Let us pray. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus welcome, into our hearts. welcome into our hearts. Help us every day, Help us every day. To, keep on welcoming you, to keep on welcoming you, serving you, serving you and, loving and loving others. Amen. Amen. Thank you, friends. Thank you, big boys and little boys. Thank you, Miss Brandy. Oh, we have to pick up our dots. I guess they can stay. That's all right. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Noah.
invite you to join with me in our opening prayer. Let us pray. God of salvation, our Lord entered his passion to raise us to life. In this holiest of weeks, help us to walk the way of the cross, that we may be raised in a resurrection like his, and dwell forever in you, eternal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. And it is great to be back. Please join me. Well, you can't even lick your finger. Please join me in the prayer for illumination, which is on the screens. Lord of the palms and Lord of the passions, open our ears and our hearts to hear the story of your triumphal entry into Jerusalem, as though for the very first time. Situate us among the joyous crowds and help us to know that we were there as well with a different crowd on Good Friday. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark in verses 1 through 11. This part of the author's life narrative of Jesus tells of his dramatic messianic entry into Jerusalem. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethphage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, Why are you doing this? Just say this. The Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them that Jesus had what they told them what Jesus had said and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple and when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. These are the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Would you pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, thank you, Mike. Once again, it is just so very good to see you here. That wasn't in my sermon. I'm just, just coming out. So here's a question for you. Have you ever found yourselves caught between two parades? Between two parades? In most of the country, as here in Virginia, that would be a very odd question indeed. But in South Louisiana, where Britt and I and our two girls lived for the past 20 years, that is an active question and one that might actually spur some discussion and debate. Um, because in South Louisiana, particularly in New Orleans and in Baton Rouge, where we lived, parades are a way of life. If you can name an occasion or a holiday, or even, really they don't even need an occasion or a holiday, they can uh, create a parade around it. Uh, with Mardi Gras, of course, being the biggest parading opportunity of them all, right? But like everything else that involves getting human beings together, Mardi Gras was canceled this past year. But even the pandemic didn't keep those South Louisianans down. They decorated their houses and yards 
like Mardi Gras floats. Yes, you may have seen some of these amazing assemblages on TV. They called it Yardi Gras. Yeah. <laughs> but back to being caught between two parades. During a regular carnival season, that might actually be a logistical problem. Say, for instance, if you're in downtown Baton Rouge at the beginning of carnival season, a couple of Saturdays before Mardi Gras Day itself, you might be forced to decide between the Cru de la Capitale and the Orion Parade. Yes, which will it be? The two parades roll, that is, start at about the same time. Will it be one or will it be both? If you wait too long, you'll find yourself pinned down by the incredible traffic and unable to go anywhere at all. Of course, if you try to hit both of them, you double your parade loot. Now, if you've never been to South Louisiana, they throw things during the parades down there. Unlike, you know, normal parades that I was used to that just have some floats and a fire engine and a marching band, they're crazy about throwing stuff off of the, the floats in South Louisiana. You can, you can amass a whole lot of loot. The Mardi Gras groups, which are called crews, throw beads and doubloons and cups and plastic swords and footballs and frisbees and stuffed animals and light up head bobbers and many, many other things. Woe be unto the parade goer who doesn't bring enough plastic shopping bags to hold all the loot. Yes, so such are the dilemmas in parade-rich South Louisiana. The consequences of making a wrong decision about which parade to attend are pretty minimal, you know, better throws next time. But that was not the case. In the springtime in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, just before the Passover, the city of David was the site of not one, but two parades, two very different parades. And on that day, it really did matter which parade you chose to attend. You just heard Mike tell us about the first one, which we will call the Jesus Parade. Now, in the Gospel of Mark, people throw down their cloaks in the road, and they go to the trees, and they cut off branches and wave them, presumably palm branches, uh, in greeting as Jesus comes riding in on a colt's back. The other Gospel accounts differ. Some have cloaks, and some have palms, and some have both. But whether it was palms or cloaks or both, I think we can say a few things for certain about the Jesus Parade. First of all, it was a pretty low-tech affair, right? No bandstands or floats, not even any throws, just a lone man on a colt, a young donkey, riding into Jerusalem through the, the great eastern gate. There were no marching bands, of course, and no recorded music, but there must have been plenty of noise because, as the scripture says, Jesus' admirers were full of exultation and joy and acclaimed him as he rode into the city Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest heaven. But they were really enthusiastic about the lone participant in this rather odd parade. Hosanna, they shouted, which means in Hebrew, save us now. The crowd sang or shouted words from the great Psalm 118, a song of praise to God as the people ascended to the temple in Jerusalem to welcome God's anointed one, the Messiah. So if you've been in Jerusalem, the city of David, and the capital of Israel, on that day not so very long ago, you would have indeed had a chance to attend not one but two parades, the rather low-tech, impromptu, in-the-moment Jesus parade, or Pilate's parade. For entering the city at the same time as Jesus, but from a different direction, there came a procession led by Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judea, the province in which Jerusalem was located. Pilate didn't especially want to be in Jerusalem on this day, with what with the city a tinderbox of passions of anti-Roman sentiment. But he was Rome's man in charge, and he had to be there to keep the peace with his war horses and stallions and chariots and armaments at the ready ready for whatever unrest might happen during the Jewish festival, the Passover, when the city was crammed full of pilgrims there to celebrate the Jewish people's deliverance from slavery in Egypt. The festival of Passover, the greatest of all the Jewish festivals, everyone who could went up to Jerusalem for the Passover. 
everyone, including rabble-rousers and insurgents and hoodlums and partisans of all kinds, trying to stir up the people against Rome, and Rome couldn't have that. So a heavy presence was called for, hence Pilate's parade. So while Jesus was making his entrance through the eastern gate, through the western gate came Pontius Pilate and his entourage. Here's how two scholars, John Crossan and Marcus Borg, describe that parade. Imagine the imperial procession's arrival in the city, a visual panoply of imperial power, cavalry on horses, foot soldiers, leather armor, helmets, weapons, banners, golden eagles glinting in the sun, sounds, the marching of feet, the creaking of leather, the clinking of bridles, the beating of drums, the swirling of dust, the eyes of the silent onlookers, some curious, some awed, and some resentful. So a very different parade indeed was the Pontius Pilate parade. No shouting onlookers, no cloaks and branches spread on the roads. Instead, war horses decked out in their own shining armor, soldiers tramping, drums playing, commands bark from the leaders to the infantrymen. Very impressive and awe-inspiring indeed, a display of military power intended to send a message to anyone thinking of stirring up any trouble. Don't do it. The might of Rome will squash you like a bug. The Emperor Augustus, who reigned at that time, considered himself to be a god and the son of Apollo, and he wanted to be worshipped appropriately. Inscriptions at the time referred to Augustus as the son of God, or Lord and Savior, and one who had brought peace on earth, the famous Pax Romana. After his death, Augustus was depicted ascending into heaven to take his permanent place among the gods. For Rome, there was no king, there was no greatest god but Caesar. So, two parades, same place, same day. Which one would you have chosen to attend had you been in Jerusalem? Your choice might have held some consequences. Would you give your allegiance to Jesus, the teacher, the healer, the worker of miracles, the prophet from Galilee, the one hailed as the Son of God? Or to Pontius Pilate, a stand-in for Caesar, who called himself the Son of God, himself the embodiment of our human need for power and control and justice at the tip of a spear or a sword? Which was the right parade, do you think, the best parade to attend? I bet that Jesus himself was probably the only person at the Jesus parade who knew that the shouts of Hosanna would turn to shouts of crucify him in less than a week. Two parades, two different agendas. You know, I think we, we Christians are people living in the in-between ourselves. We are the people of Holy Week, the week that's coming. We live between the palms and the passion, between the crucifixion and the resurrection, between Pontius Pilate and Jesus, between Rome's naked power and the justice, mercy, and love that characterize the kingdom of our God, between the life here and the life to come. And we're always trying in some way to find our way between the two, between devotion to Christ, who said that the last would be first after all, and devotion to the powers of this world, who declared that the first will stay the first and the last will stay the last because that's the way they want to keep things. Well, let's hear now from the 15th chapter of the Gospel of Mark about what happens at the other end of Holy Week, after the palms and the cloaks and the branches have all been picked up or swept away. Mike? As soon as it was morning, the chief priests held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. They bound Jesus, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, You say so. Then the chief priests accused him of many things, and Pilate asked him again, Have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply, so that Pilate was amazed. Now at the festival, he used to release a prisoner for them, anyone for whom they asked. 
Now, a man called Barabbas was in prison with the rebels who had committed murder during the insurrection. So the crowd came and began to ask Pilate to do for them according to his custom. Then he answered them, Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that the chief priests had handed him over. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to have him release Barabbas for them instead. Pilate spoke to them again. Then what do you wish me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? And they shouted back, crucify him. Pilate asked them, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, crucify him. So Pilate, wishing to satisfy the crowd, released Barabbas for them. And after flogging Jesus, he handed him over to be crucified. So from the joy of the palms to the agony of the passion. And from one small informal procession through the city gates to a sham trial before a disinterested functionary, all in the space of a week. Which parade would you have chosen? Which one would we all choose? We still choose every day. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, help us to be your eyes in this world, looking out for those who are struggling or lost. Help us to be your hands, reaching out in love to our brothers and sisters. And as we enter into Holy Week, keep our steps firm and steady as we walk with you all the way to the cross. Amen. Well, have I said it enough? Welcome back. Welcome home. <laughs> uh, and if this is your first time in our sanctuary, I say unto you, welcome home. This is your place, too. You are a beautiful looking bunch of people this morning. Yes, you are. And Reverend Lindsay and Brandy and I and all of us who lead worship are just pleased as punch to see you again. You're a sight for sore eyes, and you really be looking into the little red dot of our camera every Sunday morning. You're a much prettier sight than that dot. I hope to see you all later on this week, during the days of Holy Week, uh, for our Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday services. Both will be right here in the sanctuary at 6 p.m.
Friday, we will have a service of shadows, or tenebrae. On Easter Sunday morning, we will have two services, a, a sunrise service outside on the front lawn, praying for good weather, and a main service here in the sanctuary at 10, and you are invited to either one or to both. And please bring a friend. So now we come to our time of prayer together. And uh, it is so good to pray with you once again. As I know that many of you have already heard, Jenny and Scott Townsend's daughter, Sarah, died quite unexpectedly this past Friday. Her brother is Sam, and both Sarah and Sam were members of our church's youth group. Sarah was away at college at the time of her death, and so let us hold this family close in prayer as they grieve this terrible loss. It's a, 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 a pain that is also felt by many here in Farmville who knew Sarah growing up. Her death uh, has touched many. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And in the other cares of our congregation this morning, Ray Fawcett had a successful procedure this past week, and he is recovering at home. And Deanna Ferrer's mother, Norma Powell, who was here this past Sunday and received communion for the first time in a year, <laughs> has been diagnosed with a form of cancer, and she and her family are considering their treatment options. In our joys this week, there's the obvious joy of seeing all of you back here again. Some things haven't quite returned to normal yet. Of course, we still wear the mask, and there's still not yet any singing inside, although we are allowed to sing outside uh, a little bit. No hugs and all that quite yet, but uh, I'm giving thanks and praise to God and to medical science for all the advances that have been made in vac vaccinating our entire country and in the lowering of the numbers of the virus in our area. We've still got a ways to go, but the finish line is definitely well in sight. Praise God. So we will renew our in-person fellowship today and in the days to come, even as we continue our online fellowship on Facebook on Sunday mornings. And those who've been worshiping with us online, our congregation of the air, you are valued members indeed, and we are not going anywhere. So another great joy. Like so many other things, our church's regular mission trips to Honduras have not happened over the past year. But in another sign that life may be returning to something approaching normal, our Patty Wagner will soon be making her first trip back to Honduras in over a year. So I know that she can't wait to see old friends and to check in on new developments in the town of El Chaguiton. So please keep Patty in your prayers as well as her partners with friends of Barnabas. And as she prepares to leave uh, late next month, we will hear more from her about her journey. For all those celebrations and for all the concerns that we hold in our own hearts, let's take a deep breath now as we go to our Lord in silent prayer. Let us pray. Precious Lord Jesus, you have come to the streets of our city, humble and riding on a colt. And on this spring morning, we wave branches and we lay our cloaks in the dust before you. With the children, we shout our hosannas, glad in this wide open moment and hopeful that you are indeed the great son of David, promised of the prophets. Oh, how we still need you to save us now. In you we rest our hopes, the silent longings of our souls, our time-worn dreams. Dreams of a return to health, dreams of a just society, dreams of a world at peace. In the week ahead, Lord Jesus, from the palms and the cheers to the betrayal and the jeers and the shame and the pain, help us to make your journey with you every step of the hard and lonely way. Not turning away from the sorrow of Thursday, the pain of Friday, or the silence of Saturday. For Sunday is coming. This day and every day, it is good to join our voices in the prayer that our Lord, Lord taught us, praying together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Excuse me while I go down and grab the offering plate just a minute here. There we go. <laughs> there is a ritual that is an integral part of Christian worship that we have been missing during the past year, and that is the taking up of our tithes and offerings when the ushers pass the plates, which of course we have not been able to do uh, for reasons of health. When we lift the offering plates to God, I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like placing my whole self in the plates and just offering myself up <laughs> as a gift to God that day. When we lift these plates, we do so in gratitude to God for all that he has given us. And as the liturgy says, we return to God just a portion of what God has given us. I pray that when you place your offering in the plates, and I hope that you do at the doors, that you do so with humble and thankful hearts, knowing that even during this time of trouble and hardship, our God has been on our side. So hear now this blessing over our gifts offered already and to be offered. Holy God, we give thanks for your saving love made known to us in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. Bless these gifts that they may bless your people and enrich our witness. In Christ's name we pray, amen. And now would you please stand as we say and not sing together the words of the doxology. Praise God, from whom all blessings flow. Praise God, all creatures here below. Praise God above, ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. You may be seated. Soon we will sing the doxology once again. resurrection. May the journey of this week lead you into the fullness of Christ's love. Amen. 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 As you exit this morning, you can use either door 
a new development in the, <laughs> so feel free to leave by either side. Thank <laughs> you. 